students, welcome back to Mr. Sandwich Reads at Home Edition. I am, of course, Mr. Sandwich, and I am clearly at home. Uh, you can see my, my nice Friday clothes. My son and I will usually rock Mario on Friday, so uh, it's Mario Day. Happy Mario Day. Uh, some people might say, oh, it's Friday the 13th. I'd say it's Mario Day. All right, we left off uh, at the end of Chapter 6. Um... Dom, formerly Ben Yamo, was trying to hide on the ship as they docked America. His hope was to hide away and be taken back to Napoli to see Mama and his family in the country that he knows and loves. Uh, he had said earlier to the crew he knows how to swim, and uh, we're about to find out how well he can swim. Uh, this chapter is called Waiting, and it's on page 48. The water was farther down than I'd thought. Far enough for me to scream, far enough for me to think I was dead. I hit it with a smack and went under so deep I couldn't see anything. I put my hands over my head and swam upward as fast as I could. My hands split the water and slammed down to push me up, up. I gasped to fill my burning lungs. The swirl of water from the screw, the screw propeller engine, excuse me, the swirl of water from the screw propeller engine of my own ship pulled me under. I swam away with all my might, broke the surface, gasped, got sucked under all over again. But then my ship was gone, and I was alone in the water, with another ship coming in to harbor. I swam for the dock and latched on to a piling pole. Barnacles cut my hands and arms. I shouted. I imagined the huge ship crushing me against the pole as I screamed for help. The ship made the water rise and fall and swirl. It splashed over my head and pulled me. If I let go and swam under the dock, I might get sucked down again and not have the strength to swim up this time. So I held on with my whole body, despite the barnacles, curling myself as tight as I could, praying that none of me st stuck out past the dock's edge. The bang of the ship against the dock sent a shudder through my pole, but the ship didn't touch me. I was cold, bleeding, exhausted, and alive. Shouts of joy came from the ship as people walked down the plank. I called out. The people were looking around in wonder at the new world in front of them. Surely someone would glance down between the ship and the dock. Just one person, that was all I needed. That man in the suit, or that woman in the fancy dress. I kept calling. My throat grew hoarse. But who could hear me? Soon the passengers were gone and the crew unloaded luggage. No one was looking around in wonder anymore. I cried out again. My neck hurt from straining. I let my head fall. After a long while, a hauler came from above. I looked up. A man on the dock jabbered at me frantically. Help! I tried to shout, but it came out as a croak. Italian? He screeched. A man with a large mustache appeared and looked down at me. What are you doing there? His words sounded strange, but I understood. I fell. Can you swim? Yes! Swim under the dock. I'll throw you a rope on the other side. He disappeared. The first man still jabbered at me. I didn't move. Eventually, the Italian man came back. Go! Go to the other side. It's not safe to pull you up on the, si on the side with the ship. Understand? I'll wait, I said. For what? Till the ship leaves. Only first and second class were allowed to disembark. The rest of the passengers won't be processed for days. I had no idea what that meant. Did you hear me? The ship won't leave for three days, at the least. I whimpered. Stay put. I'll find someone who can swim. His face disappeared again. In a little while, gasping breaths came from under the dock. Here, I called out. I'm here. An older man swam to me. He grabbed the pole, then cursed as he pulled his bleeding hands aw hand away. He carried the end of a rope between his teeth. He took it out and offered it to me. I didn't let go of the pole. I couldn't. I was stuck. The man grabbed my ear and twisted. Ah! I let go of the pole with one hand and clawed at him. He looped the rope around my chest and gave a yank, and I was jerked away through the water. I spun. Water went up my nose and down my throat. I was drowning. Then I was suddenly out in the air, swinging like a clump of seaweed on a hook. I landed in a heap on the hot dock. Someone asked me in plain language who I was. But my eyes were closed against the bright sun, and I wasn't sure I could open them. My bones ached from being in the cold water. My teeth chattered. 
I could hear men talking, trying to guess how I'd gotten down there, who I was. That had to be my passenger ship. It was from Napoli, and my speech told them I was too, and I had to be a boy from a good family with shoes like that. I must have fallen off the plank when the first and second class passengers disembarked. Someone would surely pay a reward for their saving me. They argued about who deserved the reward. Then they worried that instead of a reward, they'd get blamed for my winding up in the water. That ended that. Someone wrapped a padded crate cloth around me and rubbed my back and arms and legs through the cloth. Gradually, warmth radiated from my middle. But I still wouldn't open my eyes. I wanted whoever was holding me to keep holding me. He carried me, bumping through crowds. I took a peek. Everyone was rushing. They talked funny. And they carried canes and wore so many clothes, jackets and hats. Even the men working the docks had on shirts under that beating sun. He carried me into a brick building filled with people in nice clothes, packed together. Men in uniform stood beside them, holding on to giant hand carts of baggage. He spoke to a man who called out strange things through his megaphone. Another man came running and took the megaphone and announced in playing language, Who's missing a Neapolitano boy? He pointed at me. What a nightmare for his parents, a woman said. Take him back to the ship right away. A man touched the rip in my pants, the one I'd gotten my first day on the ship. It had grown so big, I could put my hand through it. You're third class, he wagged his head. Another man pulled me by the, ha by the hand back to the dock and up onto the ship and left me there. What? Just like that. The crew was still unloading luggage and no one seemed to have noticed me. I scrambled over by a mast out of the way and watched. The heat of the day slowly dried me. The drier I got, the better I felt. Life was looking up. I was back on a ship, a passenger ship. This might even be better than my cargo ship. I wandered into a room with a bed and desk and many ledgers. One lay open, <clears throat> excuse me, one lay open, listing name after name. This was the record of passengers. I had to stay out of the way of whoever kept it. I walked out quickly, my heart thumping, and went straight to a group of lifeboats along the side. I held on to the rail and looked down and tried to blend with the background. Time passed, and no one came to chase me away. The smell of food got me wandering again. I hadn't eaten since that squirt of cow's milk. I grew, a crew member glanced at me, then stopped his work to look again. I ran to the closest hatch and scooted down below deck. I sank into a sea of people. Most were quiet, putting their energy into the struggle to breathe in this heat. Putting their energy into the struggle to breathe in this heat. Some grumbled that they weren't allowed up on deck. The only people left on the ship now were third class passengers. A man said they were 520 of them, all in a stench of vomit and feces. Here in the dark, no one could see beyond arm's length, but there was bread with lard spread, salty and delicious, and all I really wanted to do was stay on this ship, home to Mama. It was just a matter of time. My Mama. The officers allowed us to sleep on the top deck. Babies cried. Men cursed. I was too wound up to do anything but wander among them. I found a man and two boys wearing yarmulkes, but I couldn't understand them, so I hung around Neapolitani and listened. They pointed at a statue in the harbor and fell to their knees in prayer. I thought about, I thought often of Uncle Aurelio and his speeches about La Possibilita. The next day, the quarantine station officers came on board. People had been warning one another about them. They checked for typhus, yellow fever, smallpox. The trick was to stand at attention, look alert, and no matter what, not cough. I was grateful to know the trick. Some who didn't were taken off someplace. It was rumored that they went into observation far away, and if they got sicker, they went into isolation somewhere even further away. After that, who knew what became of them? That second night, I took my shoes off and spread out my socks to air. I carefully tucked the cloth with the tassels inside one shoe, and I used, instead, the corner of the padded crate cloth that I carried everywhere to rub the shoe leather soft, because it had dried hard again after being in the water. When I went to put my shoes back on, I couldn't find my socks, my zitzit, my tassels. No! I felt all over the floor around me. I ran through the clusters of people, looking everywhere. 
I tugged on the women's skirts and asked for help. I looked and looked and looked. No, no, no. My grandfather's prayer shawl tassels were gone. America had thieves like Napoli, but worse ones, far worse. I stared out over the buildings of New York and pressed the heels of my hands against my eyelids. Still, the tears came. I brushed them away as fast as they fell. Some of those buildings seemed as tall as Vesuvio, but they didn't make me feel uplifted like the high building of my synagogue in Napoli. Instead, I felt tiny and weak. I turned my back to them and looked at the statue others had prayed to, the Grand Statue of Liberty. I didn't want liberty. I stood there snuffling. All I wanted was to go home. Okay. So in this chapter, uh, where are they? Where are they docking? Well, if it's in the harbor where you see the Statue of Liberty and uh, immigrants are coming off, they're at Ellis Island. Uh, I did uh, interview my father. Unfortunately, uh, the audio was not great, so I am transcribing that so that uh, has captions. Um, but a lot of connections, so I hope to have that up soon, uh, and I do hope you enjoy that. But uh, he talks about the experience of his great-grandparents, so my great-great-grandparents, um, coming to America through Ellis Island. Um, actually, no, in this case, it was not through Ellis Island, but it was as third-class passengers like we see in here. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about those connections another time, but, uh, very realistic. Again, the, the genre here is historical fiction. Um, so it's a made up story, but based on historical events, uh, as they actually occurred. So accurate depictions here. Uh, if you recall, uh, Dom's method of, of digging his palm into his eye, sorry, if that freaks you out there, um, was his way of doing what it goes back to the last chapter. That's him trying to hold back the tears. In this case, he was unable to do that. All right. Um, that's really it. Again, the shoes, he's trying to take care of those shoes, but man, they keep getting wet and uh, water is no good for leather. Um, so it's been quite an adventure for Dom for many ammo and little shoes. I hope you enjoyed uh, chapter seven there. I uh, will follow up with chapter eight soon. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe, and uh, I hope you enjoy. All right, take it easy. Peace.